Or the horse, we've done the horse. Okay, we're going to talk about some smaller ruminants now, um, and we're going to consider sheep and goats um, and their evolutionary background. So, sheep and goats, but I'll, I'm focusing on sheep at the moment, evolved basically as mountain herbivores. So, very different from cattle, which have, cattle evolved in Southeast Asia in uh, lowland conditions, hot, humid conditions. They can tolerate very wet conditions. Sheep, mountainous animals, their ability to, to run and to jump and to be um, agile is, is legendary. Again, they're a prey species. Their vision and their olfaction is all rather similar to, to cattle. Um, but they're very timid, nervous animals, they're easily frightened, so they're much more gregarious than cattle. Um, cattle will group together, but sheep are, are even more stressed if they're isolated. They're easily frightened by loud noises and isolation. Um, so they are herbivores with very limited browsing. Sheep will take material from trees. They'll ring bark trees. So you know if you have a stand of a, f a new forest coming up, sheep will, they have a, a big demand for fiber. Uh, just like cattle, uh, they have that um, uh, modified forestomach in the rumen, um, and they have that big demand for fiber, which means if you put them on a very lush pasture, they will eat the bark of the trees and if they eat around the, uh, 
the bar uh, totally around the bark of the trees, it stops the um, water passing up through the tree and they will kill trees. Um, and that can be a problem in silvopastoral systems, you know, agroforestry systems where you have trees and livestock together. Sheep will damage trees very significantly. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so how do they defend themselves against predators? They'll run like horses. Um, they'll form into a flock. And again, sheep, of course, um, uh, traditionally had horns to protect themselves. So they will stand and charge um, in the same way that cattle will corral themselves into a circle and then attack a predator. And anyone who has been charged by a ram uh, will know that it's just as painful and uh, um, potentially damaging as being charged by a bull. <laughs> that might seem a bit crazy, but they do a, they do a lot of damage and they will kill each other. Rams will um, uh, charge each other and they will, they will quite easily kill each other in their fighting. So they're, they're pretty aggressive animals. <coughs> their perceptive faculties in terms of nutrition, uh, I've talked about that already. Um, uh, they use taste, they don't use sight, they use taste and feel, and they have that blind spot in front of the muzzle. They're particularly um, uh, concerned about the smell of food. So here's some results of um, uh, feed intake from feeds which have been contaminated with smells. And this is two groups of sheep, one which have normal spelling, smelling capacity and one which uh, so-called anosmic sheep, their nose has been rendered uh, dysfunctional physiologically. And so contaminating the feed with the smell of coyote, fox and cougar, we can see that um, uh, there's a huge impact of the smell on feed intake. The sheep get very frightened when they smell those potential predators. Okay, um, we've talked about the feeding quite a bit already, but they will graze very close to the ground. Cattle need um, at least six to ten centimeters of pasture to graze and to be able to survive and thrive. Sheep can graze down at two or three centimeters because they've got those very fine small mouth parts. They're much more selective than cattle. They will graze individual um, heads of grass, so they'll just take the seeds of heads of grass. Cattle could never do that. Uh, the, uh, like cattle, they will graze typically for eight to ten hours a day. They're crepuscular, grazing morning and night. Um, pretty similar behavior in that respect. They have preferred areas, um, and I've mentioned in the past how mixing the grazing can lead to better utilization of the feed. So mixing cattle and sheep together will give you better utilization of grassland. In mountainous regions, um, the sheep learn which their territory is. And indeed, um, in the mountainous regions of Europe, for instance, you will typically sell a farm with its sheep on the farm. Okay, you don't, you don't sell the land and then someone brings some sheep. You sell the farm with the sheep because those sheep have learned about that territory. They're identified as belonging to the farm. And those sheep would only be collected once or twice a year in those mountainous regions of Europe. Perhaps just when you're drafting off the lambs um, and maybe when you're having to dip for flies or whatever in the summer. Um, in terms of their feeding behavior, things can go wrong. Um, in very short pasture on the mountains, um, because 
the mountains are often overstocked and the pasture becomes very short and the sheep start consuming bits of stones, small stones, and that wears their teeth down and we get what you call broken mouthed ewes. Um, and one of the, when the sheep are drafted from the hill areas, the broken mouthed ewes are removed. Now, there used to be a very horrific welfare practice to try and make their mouths, make their teeth better. Because what happens with broken mouthed ewes is that some of the teeth are long, some of them are short, um, a bit like when rabbits or guinea pigs are not given the right sort of food and their, their teeth don't meet and they keep growing. With, with sheep, um, you get the teeth which are different levels. And so a practice was developed in Australia, of course, um, whereby people used an angle grinder to try and level up the teeth, um, uh, ignoring the fact that the teeth have a very sensitive um, pulp cavity within them. Um, it worked, but the welfare impact on the animal was, was enormous. That practice is now illegal uh, in Europe, and it is also illegal in Australia, thank goodness. Um, so broken-mouthed ewes can be a problem. Those sheep are taken down from the hill areas, and they're grazed in lowland regions. Uh, and that's a, a sort of natural transhumance, what we call moving the animals from the hill areas, um, where the nutrition is not very good, to give them one or two more years down in the lowland areas. Housed sheep can, are particularly at risk of having nutrition problems um, because, again, they get fed sometimes too much concentrates and they need that fiber, that coarse fiber. So what do they do? They start eating the wood. They start eating other sheep's wool, wool nibbling. Um, and then there's that other sheep problem which I've talked to you about already, inappetence or shy feeding. Um, and that's not necessarily because the sheep can't reach the food, they can, um, but the stress if the stress levels are too high, then um, uh, the animals don't want to feed. And it's the same for all animals, really. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a very stressful theatre performance to do f the last few weekends, um, all those that weren't stressed by it were happily munching away in the dressing rooms. Uh, but no, I was very stressed, so I, I wouldn't eat anything before the, before the show. Uh, in fact, for a long time before the show. So stress kills the appetite. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay. We're moving on to goats now. So this is sheep and goats, uh, and thinking of the characteristics of, of, of um, the evolution of goats. So again, they are mountain animals, um, and they have an even greater need for, um, for fibrous material. So in, in talking about goats, I'm going to consider their nutrition, what happens uh, in their transport when they're deprived of food, some of the intensive systems, handling and housing, what disease problems they're subjected to. So we're, we're, we're considering the goat and its characteristics, in particular uh, how it differs from sheep. Um, I, I should have mentioned as well that, of course, the, the forestomach, the, the rumen, the modified forestomach, the rumen in sheep and goats, is much smaller than in cattle. So they are not able to digest quite as much coarse fiber. Um, having said that, goats can survive on very little, and so can sheep. And they both have a characteristic of being able to produce a very dehydrated pellet, dehydrated feces. So goats and sheep can both withstand much drier conditions than cattle. In cattle, the feces is quite moist depending on the moisture content of the feed, but with sheep and goats, they can survive much better. And that's because they come from mountainous regions, which are at times very dry, whereas cattle come from Southeast Asia, um, where rainfall is, is high. Goats, like, uh, like cattle, were domesticated about 10,000 years ago. 
The first cattle were domesticated in Africa, uh, and they then spread um, to the Indian subcontinent uh, and then to, to Europe, three main uh, subspecies of cattle. African cattle, the Indian, and the, the European. Uh, so that um, introductory time when agriculture was becoming important, uh, that was about 10,000 years ago. That's when sheep and goats were domesticated in the Fertile Crescent, in that uh, land between the Tigris and the Euphrates in what is now Iraq, was at that time very fertile. And over the process of time, as time went on, of course, high stocking densities um, uh, and the land became denuded. Uh, man has many examples of when he has um, introduced bad agricultural systems which eventually um, ruin the land. It happened in South America with the Incas. It happened in the Middle East well before that time. Um, and some people will say it's happening now in Australia and we need to avoid it. So they are small, efficient, multi-purpose ruminants. They can't digest that really coarse fiber, but um, they, can, they, they have the capacity to eat small amounts of feed and survive on it. If you think of mountain, mountain terrain and the, the um, uh, plants that grow on it, it's not your lush green pastures which we provide for cattle. It's small bushes here and there, um, and sheep are able to survive in those mountainous regions where cattle could never survive. If you go to the upland regions, the hill and upland regions of the United Kingdom, for example, you'll find that in the upland regions you've got cattle. On the really hill areas of Wales and Scotland, you've got um, uh, sheep because cattle can't survive there. The world goat population is currently around 800 million, um, so a little bit less than cattle. There's about a billion cattle in the world today. Um, but goats are still very, very important in some countries. The three leading um, countries for goat production are China, India, Pakistan, and Nigeria. So India has a very significant goat population. And typically, they're managed in village production systems. They're not used so intensively. They're, they're kept in small farms, often managed by the women. So the um, way in which the women are taught is really important. So if, if training advice is being given, say in Kenya, where 66% of the village production systems are managed by women, it's really important that that advice is given to the women and not to the men. They're dual purpose animals, of course, uh, for meat and milk, um, and they predominate in less favored areas, such as northwest Pakistan, the, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the desert there, the Cholistan Desert, Cholistan Desert, where uh, there are cattle, but um, goats are, uh, are, are a much cheaper animal to, to um, buy and sell. So um, they're often used by uh, villagers where there's not a lot of money to buy expensive cattle. And the same in Africa, um, a cheaper option for livestock production. Okay. Um, there is growing attention for um, sheep and goats, but particularly goats, to peri-urban production systems. Uh, and Kushpu, Kushpu was telling me the other day that that is one of their focuses here in India, um, the, the growth of peri-urban milk production systems. Um, but with the rising populations in the cities, the growing affluence and the growing demand for uh, animal products, peri-urban dairy systems are becoming really important. Um, but the perennial problem, the, the problem always is, where's the food coming from? Are these animals scavenging on tips? If so, they're consuming a lot of plastic. Um, Kushpu told me that the record for plastic consumption was found in an old bull who'd, who'd eaten 160 kilos of plastic. I couldn't believe that, but I thought, 
because I thought the record was 60 kilos, but whatever. Um, there's a lot of inert material going into the rumen of these scavengers. And plastic has no nutritional value, and it occupies space in the rumen, space that could be used for, um, uh, uh, for, for, for food consumption. And the, um, the limitations on feed intake in ruminants are first and foremost the size of the rumen. So the, the, the rumen cannot expand forever. If you use half of its capacity, fill half of its capacity with plastic, then there's no room for the food. Why do cattle eat plastic? Because it's not, not a natural food. Mm. And, uh, and if it smells, it does not get a favorable smell. So why, why do it eat plastic? I think a lot of it's incidental. They're obviously looking for the food that's within the plastic, you know, the, the waste chapatis. Yeah, they can't see it all that well. Um, they're also quite likely to be short of fiber, and they may imagine that the plastic has some fiber potential, but it doesn't. Um, so it doesn't break down. No, absolutely. No. Um, uh, we have a big push in the West to replace plastic bags with um, uh, things that do break down. Degradable products and I did notice buying some um, goods in your supermarkets here that a, a sort of degradable um, fiber was being used you're a bit ahead of us in, in that respect um, in, in Queensland plastic is coming out of supermarkets in, in a year or two yes on this campus plastic is banned really okay yes yeah, so those... How do you enforce that? There are no Coca-Cola bottles in the shops. Mm. Plastic packaging. Mm. Very good. I don't think it's also bad. Mm. Yeah. Plastic products. Yes. Plastic bags. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess they just take it, accident, take it in accidentally because, you know, cattle, they're not that... I, I won't say they're not intelligent. They're very intelligent, but they're not... Um, they're not like us. They can't open a plastic bag and take the food out and <laughs> consume it. You know, it's, it's really difficult for them. And their eyesight, you know, you've got, if you've got eyes on the side of your head, it's, it's not very easy. Their, lip, their tongue is not that um, adept that it can extract the food from the plastic bag. That's my, my belief. I might be wrong. And they don't know that it's poisonous to them. You know, to know that a food is poisonous uh, they have to get feedback. That feedback has to be relatively quick. It's no good, you know, an animal consuming a little bit of plastic every day, and by the time it gets to two years of age, it's got so much plastic in it that there's no room for any food. There's no feedback there. But if it consumes a toxic plant, for instance, it's getting feedback almost immediately, and the brain is very, very clever um, in linking that plant to the, um, you know, we, we all know what it's like. You, you've probably done it. You, uh, you know, as a teenager, I, I used to get very hungry. My mother gave me a tin of rhubarb. I ate it all at once and never liked rhubarb afterwards. <laughs> uh, so we, we all do it. The, the, the brain is very clever. And ruminants are just, just like that as well. But they're not clever enough to sort the plastic from the food. Okay, relatively low value animal, amazingly low value. In uh, Australia, goats can sell for five or ten dollars each. You know, um, there's very little demand. Most of the demand is for the ethnic communities, for, for, for the, um, some of the Muslim communities that want to eat goat meat. But give your average Australian, uh, um, you know, goat loins, a, a goat steak, wouldn't eat it. No. Definitely not. Um, and they're relatively cheap. They're yeah, used as a means of weed control as well in some countries. In South America, um, they have a big problem with uh, introduced plants in some of the mountainous regions, um, gorse in particular. I'm not sure if you have gorse in India. A very prickly, very prickly plant. 
Uh, and so they introduced goats to try and control them. They couldn't get enough goats to control these weeds. Um, it was so, ra so rampant was the growth. But goats can use their mouth parts to eat these very prickly feeds. There's a risk that they'll um, have uh, pustular dermatitis. They'll have um, uh, uh, disease coming in if the, if the lips get um, bloody, but they're, they're still able to do it. Um, the big problem, of course, with an animal that is worth so little is undernutrition that they're, they're starved effectively, no feed for them. And that's common to the terrain which they inhabit. You know, often feed supplies are, are limited um, and sporadic. And so they, they do a lot of damage. They, they like to eat, they'll eat tree material and they're very adept climbers. Um, and so, you know, this is how they, they have to get their green material responsible for a lot of da land degradation. Um, native to, to Eurasia, of course, so in Australia they're considered um, an invasive pest and may be slaughtered as a result. So we, we will round up large numbers of goats in Australia and send them to the Middle East for their festivals, the Festival of Eids. Um, and it's a horrific process. There are real welfare problems because the goats um, uh, don't travel well. Mortality is about 2% on average, whereas mortality of sheep under those conditions is just 1%. Um, uh, because they're feral animals. And in some of the more remote national parks, we have feral goats, which again just get rounded up and put on a boat and sent overseas because they're not seen as native. Um, drought feeding is very important to maintain productivity and again like sheep have to be very careful with um, animals bullying each other um, so sometimes you actually put the feed round in a circle because the animal at the end of this line here may well get pushed off the end and then not get any feed if you put it round in a circle then that can't happen <coughs> There's growing competition um, between agriculture and pastoral nomadism. We, we may consider this on the last day. It's one of the real problems with our, um, our, our pastoral ruminants, uh, that settled agriculture and crop production, which produces food more effectively, um, as long as the land is reasonable quality, is competing with the traditional practices of pastoral nomadism in Africa, in Asia, um, and uh, causing uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of friction. So population pressure is decreasing land availability. I forget what the statistic is exactly, but the population of Africa is set to uh, double in the next 30 years, something like that. It's, it's truly horrendous. Um, the, the scale of population growth and that will have a big impact on traditional livestock systems because they are using the marginal land. <coughs> so just to conclude on the goat, it's a low value animal, it's kept on marginal land and so its nutrition is often compromised. Any, any questions on the goat? All happy? Anyone worked with goats? <coughs> they're lovely animals, but they're quite prone to respiratory infections. They're quite tender animals, although they're kept under some very harsh conditions. They're quite soft in some ways. And, of course, in terms of their thermoregulation, they have hair, not wool. Um, and so, you know, they don't conserve the heat as much. They reflect the heat. Okay, let's move on to the pig. Um, anyone worked with pigs? No. Well, pigs aren't as commonly eaten here in India, but in China, pigs are the number one animal that's, that's eaten and very traditional there. Except, so, except for the northeast. Yes, yes. Um, oh, the northeast of India. India. Okay, yeah, so near China. 
Yeah, okay, right. Well, the wild boar, of course, is a Eurasian animal. Um, pigs are eating. It's not that pigs are not eating. Pigs are eaten by certain societies in, in India as well. Okay. And uh, because Gautama Buddha was supposed to have uh, passed away after eating infected pig meat. Yes. He knew it was uh, infected, but he didn't want to disappoint the disciples. Uh, who was that, sorry? Gautama Buddha. 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 Oh, Buddha. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Unlike, um, uh, uh, of course, the Muhammad uh, um, take on eating pig meat was generally, no, you don't do it. So the Muslim faith generally are not consuming pig meat. Um, any Muslims here today? Or? No? Okay. Um, so what about the pig? What's it, what's it like? Well, wild boars are, say, present throughout Europe and Asia, distributed in the forest, so it's a forest-dwelling animal. Um, communicating quite vocally, so pigs are very vocal animals. Um, and it's an omnivore, it's unspecialized, it'll eat anything. It'll eat carrion, uh, it'll, eat, it'll scavenge. Um, it'll eat grain crops, often in competition with uh, agriculturalists. Um, what's its strategy for defense against predators? Uh, anyone, any thoughts? How does it defend itself against predators? Any thoughts? If you look at it, if I can infer from the warthogs of Africa, uh, they'll just face, yes. face the predator and, and charge. Okay. What gives it the grounds to do that? Uh, what, uh, warthogs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What, what? Because, they, because they have this, this horn. Yeah. They've got big tusks. Yeah, big tusks. Yeah. Big tusks. Yeah. So the, the, the females, the boars, um, have the big tusks to protect, uh, protect them. But they have another strategy to... Um, avoid predation as well. They're denning animals, so they will s um, scatter to a den and um, survive underground. Um, so th they're relatively unspecialized, no horns, no antlers, but they have tusks. Uh, and the carnivore-like habit of using dens, making nests, and bearing litters. So making nests is really important. Now we're not talking here today about general welfare issues, but I talk to my students a lot about the sow's need to make a nest. It's really, really strong. The home range, they're after energy. They're, they're monogastric animals. So they're like, they're, they're monogastric, um, Gas, their gastrointestinal tract is actually quite similar to our own, much more similar than any of the other animals we've mentioned. So pigs are actually quite often used as models in, in research for humans um, or, and in medicinal research as well. Um, so they're, they're looking for high energy foods, in cro high energy crops, swamps, forests. Um, they will scrape out a lying area. They have a very good memory of their home range and their scent marking. Uh, and they will use local vegetation for nest building, really important. Again, they use a latrine like horses, so they will eliminate away from the nest. That's important in some um, husbandry systems because in, um, say, a veranda system, we have a housed area and an outdoor area for pigs. Not so common these days, but the pigs would quite naturally go outside to defecate. That's a really useful strategy for keeping the housed area clean um, and dry. Cattle doesn't work. You cannot train cattle to defecate outside if you give them a choice of a housed area and an outside area. They just do it anywhere. And who said pigs are dirty and uh, cattle are clean? <laughs> Is that a welfare issue in farrowing pens as well? Because they can't actually move out. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess the farrowing pen is constructed so the pig can't move at all. Mm. So the feces is voided, you know, pretty much outside of the pen. Um, yeah. But it's only, it can only be a foot away. Yes, that's right. 
Yes, well, the piglets might get contaminated, I guess. Yeah, horrible things, farin crates. Anyway. So what about the natural diet of the wild boar, the, uh, the warthogs? Uh, um, it's mostly plant material. Um, and there is some fermentation. Uh, pigs will ferment uh, in their hindgut. Um, uh, they'll cement grasses that they eat. So they have bacteria colonizing the gut, just as we do. You know, now we haven't got our friend dealing with probiotics today, um, but he would have told us all about the colonization of the gut um, and how important it is to have a benign microflora in your gut. Pigs are just the same. Um, they need to have a benign microflora. Unlike, you know, dogs, dogs can kill off bacteria very easily. pH 2 in their, in their stomach, so anything that goes in will get killed. You don't need to um, maintain that benign microflora. And then they'll eat small animals, earthworms, crustaceans, insects, little frogs, um, reptiles or rodents. So they really are omnivores. Um, they'll eat carrion, dead animals. Um, there, there is a major nutritional problem with pigs, and that is the dry sows. Uh, so the, the, the pregnant sow, before she gives birth, um, is prone to becoming fat. And so farmers like to keep them in individual pens and restrict their food intake. And people see that as a major welfare problem. And so some people are developing uh, systems where the, the, the pig has a collar around its neck and it has a, a key to get, get food, um, so it's not kept in a stall. Aren't they banned? They're banned in some parts of the world. Um, they're banned in Europe. Um, they are, there was a voluntary... Um, Australia, it's a long story, it started in Tasmania where they were voluntarily banned and that spread throughout the whole of Australia, um, uh, a voluntary ban by industry. Of course, government never does anything, but um, yeah, so in some parts of the world they are banned. In some parts of the world they are banned for a period of time. So, say, no more than six weeks in these individual stalls. Okay, now... We need to just have a look and see if we can pick that up. Why is that not? Here we go. That is not looking like a hyperlink. Um, that's unfortunate. I wonder if I can just copy that in because it's a rather nice little um, video clip of pigs bar biting. So when we put pigs in very um, stressful conditions, they spend a lot of time doing this. Here we are. So this is what we call bar biting. We don't seem to have any sound. Can everyone see that okay? You can see it. Uh, so this this sow will spend perhaps a third of its working day, its waking day, a third of its waking day bar biting. Th this is sham chewing in the pig. So the pig will spend a lot of time lying there chewing on nothing. And you can see the salivation. I'll talk about that in a minute. Sham chewing, tongue lolling, tongue lolling in the pig, like we, we, we talked about in cattle, tongue lolling, extruding the tongue, um, and, okay. Anyone want to see it again? You okay? Okay, good. Um, so, why does the pig perform these behaviors? Any thoughts? Why does the pig spend all this time in this strange oral behavior? 
Well, there may be digestive benefits. I mean, for a long time it was thought that it's just indicative of poor quality, of a poor quality environment. Just showing that the environment for the pig was really bad when they're kept in small cages. Um, there's a lot of, and there's a lot of fighting between growing pigs. Um, and then the sows, uh, all they're doing is producing piglets, getting pregnant again, producing piglets again. It's a pretty bad life. And so um, it was thought that this was just showing that the, the pigs had a very bad life. But now, um, in the last sort of 10, 15 years, it's become pretty clear that there are digestive benefits. And they're just the same as we would have. If our life is very stressful, what happens to us in terms of our gastrointestinal tract? Anyone? <laughs> what, what, what problem do we get in our gastrointestinal tract if we're very s stressed? It is Sorry? Acidic, uh, yes. Ruptures or something. Yes, yes. Ulceration. Ulceration, absolutely. Yes, gastric ulcers. Pigs get just the same, gastric ulcers. Horses do as well, actually, um, and uh, particularly race horses. So um, the, this, these behaviors, these st oral stereotypies, like the cribbing, which I showed you in the horses, that's to produce saliva. Saliva is very alkaline, and it counteracts the acidity in the stomach. Um, so if you're ever at risk of gastric ulceration, chew some gum, and you'll um, start producing more alkaline sal saliva. Digestive benefits. Um, one of the other digestive benefits actually was, was thought to be, I can't remember whether it was proven to be, was getting salt from the diet, because pigs as well can be quite short of salt. Not as short of salt as cattle. Cattle and sheep, salt is so important because um, the, the grasses which they're eating are generally very low in sodium. Any questions on pigs? We're racing through the species. Okay. All happy about pigs. Let's talk about chickens. Very important in India as well. And worldwide, chicken consumption is going up very, very much more rapidly than any other meat. We'll talk about that in our final session. Um, the industry here is, is pretty different to the ones that we've talked about already. Um, generally, the production units are very big. There could be 20,000 animals. There are hardly any cattle units with 20,000 animals on them. And it's an integrated system. So the companies managing those systems, they control the feeding of the birds very carefully. The environment's controlled as well, of course. Um, it's an all-in, all-out system. So the, the birds come in as chicks. Um, they're reared over uh, six weeks and then they go out, the, the house is rested for a few days and then the next lot come in. Um, there may be some sequential, uh, there may be some depopulation over time, depends where you are in the world. <coughs> there is a growing interest in free-range housing and you were telling me Prasenjit I think that even free-range eggs command a premium here on campus, which is really good to hear. They claim to be free range. And, uh, you eat that egg, definitely tastes different. Mm. Uh, Is there a central body that kind of monitors it and makes sure the, that it's the, the packings come with this statement that these are free range uh, eggs? Mm. Is that certified by anyone? Uh, not the government. Not the government. You just, you just buy it on trust. Yeah. 
the sort of vegetation that you have on campus here, the lush post-monsoonal growth is really good, suitable for chickens. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty similar to the, you know, the jungle conditions they would experience in Malaysia or you know, as jungle fowl. Yeah, so I guess there, there are some um, people looking after free-roaming chickens. Um, okay, so, so the production units are quite different to we see those we see um, in other meat production systems. Um, th th they evolved, as co of course, as jungle fowl with um, very different morphological characteristics. So the jungle fowl are small, you know, one kilo animals, whereas these meat chickens are grown to two, two kilos within a period of six weeks. It's almost not the same animal. Um, but having said that, we can look at the characteristics of jungle fowl. They, for instance, they need to um, pick small bits of grit from the ground, so they digest the feed in, in the crop, um, uh, which, uh, the, because they're predominantly seed-eating animals, they need little stones in their crop, um, or gizzard, they need the stones there to grind the, grind the um, grains together because a lot of grains are hard seeded. Now the grains that we use for agricultural purposes, wheat, barley, etc., they are soft coated. But the seeds which they will be consuming um, on the ground, um, at least half of them will be hard coated and they need to grind them to extract the starch from the grains. Um, okay, now we've tended, of course, to automate the feeding of chickens in battery cages. Um, th this is the laying hen, of course. Um, and so the food provision is automated uh, and the waste removal is automated as well. So the whole process is automated. Uh, the animal doesn't get to walk around um, very much at all. And for that reason, um, we begin to get, see some problems. Now, one of the major problems in battery cage hens is feather pecking. They will peck each other's feathers. Why do they do that? Anyone, any ideas? Calcium. Calcium. Okay, I'm, I haven't heard that before, but I mean, they, they are very prone to calcium deficiency, so uh, it could be... Yeah, well, how do they get calcium from the feathers, though? Because they only pluck them out, they don't eat them. An interesting idea. The two main theories is that they are, um, uh, it's a redirected foraging behavior. Um, so they are pulling out the feathers because they're looking for long you know, grass or fiber of some sort. So chickens don't just eat seeds they will need some more fibrous material as well. So that's one theory, that, that we're, we're not allowing them to forage. They will spend eight hours a day in the wild foraging, picking on the ground all the time. Um, and so it's that redirected foraging behavior, not necessarily for grass, but for whatever they can get, so maybe some insects. They need something a little bit more fibrous than just, just the seeds. Redirected foraging behavior. And then the other one is that it's um, to do with aggression um, between the birds because you get five or six birds in a cage and they, they fight sometimes. But the science really says that um, by putting these five or six birds into a cage in very close proximity, they're actually not that aggressive to each other. Whereas if you give them more space, they become more aggressive because they've got the space to be aggressive. In the, in the battery cage, they, they can't even flap their wings or anything. They have no space to do anything. They don't have the space to fight. So <coughs> most people, I think, believe that feather pecking is a foraging behavior. And that is why in Europe, um, they've introduced enlarged cages, which take about 10 birds, uh, 10 or 20 birds, so-called furnished cages, um, where they 
they add some grit, they provide some grit, they provide a perch for the birds to, to get onto at night because um, that's their natural behavior. Um, they provide an area to scratch as well, again that's their natural behavior. And they provide a nest box and they give them a bit more space. Um, so worldwide you, you've got sort of three production systems. You've got your very intensive battery cages, you've got your in, enriched cages which are generally only used in Europe and then you've got your free-range birds means giving them space. However, giving the birds space may not work all that well. Um, so the natural, the natural behavior of the birds um, in industrialized systems, 95% of the birds are fed on concentrated foods. Um, cereals, uh, soya beans, and Maize, yes, it's, it's maize based. Maize and soya. Most chickens are fed on maize and soya. And so we've seen enormous areas in the United States devoted to growth of maize and soya. And not just the United States, Brazil as well. Uh, on the last day, I think I'll show you a slide of Brazil's growth in maize production, exponential. And it's to produce chickens. Um, and, and it's having big environmental consequences um, which we won't consider. If on the other hand we consider our village systems, household refuse, um, crop residues and soil uh, are the main um, uh, feeds which the chickens will, will take. Uh, they will select out from the, the ground little beetles, spiders, other insects and some earthworms as well. So a very varied diet, and that's why the eggs taste so good. <laughs> I, I've kept chickens um, with horses in a sort of free-range system, and yes, the eggs, they're a different product, you know, a totally different product. And I think you were saying people were prepared to pay twice as much here, yes, on this which is amazing. Well, yes, on this campus, it's a relatively... It's the same in supermarkets. They're double-priced. Okay. Really? So double the price, whereas in Europe and in Australia it's maybe plus 10% mm. or maybe maybe 20%, a yeah. bit more, but not double the price. Um, yeah, that's the power of the supermarkets to di dictate the way in which animals are produced, which is good. Mm. You know, who, who's driving animal welfare? Government? No, not usually. Um, the consumer consumer is driving animal welfare which means the consumer needs information we did a survey uh, um, oh, in Brisbane you'd think a relatively well-educated sector of the population 60% of people thought that meat chickens were produced in battery cages which of course they're not they're produced in you know um, in barns so there's a huge degree of ignorance out there so the, the, the wild chickens are pecking at small particles and they teach their chicks um, to distinguish the food. I had a lovely photograph actually, I maybe should have brought for you. I was in Madagascar a few months, uh, um, last year, and uh, it just emphasized to me that, that enormous behavioral repertoire that chickens have. I, it was raining heavily as it always does in Madagascar and this chicken, uh, she got her wings and spread them out in a sort of a, like an umbrella. And I thought, what's she doing that for? Underneath were all her little chicks. She was protecting them from the rain. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're very clever animals. Not bird-brained at all. Um, adults are teachers. Uh, feeding is a social behavior in chickens, as it is in all the species we've considered so far. And we've talked about feather pecking being generally considered to be a redirected foraging. There are still people who debate that, but I don't think they're right. Drinking behavior, um, pecking at shiny surfaces, yeah, it teaches the young birds to distinguish water. Um, but there is a thing about um, drinking in chickens that if they're very stressed, 
as in battery cages or um, uh, you know, meat chicken production systems where they've got no more space than they physically occupy, then they engage in a behavior called polydipsia where they drink a lot very often just to keep themselves occupied. Um, and that can lead to very wet litter uh, and causes hock burn and foot necrosis. These are really big problems with the meat chicken. Um, if you go into the supermarket and you buy a chicken and it looks like the, um, uh, the hocks have got scalded, so it's, it's red, it's not properly covered in skin, that's because of the acid conditions that they've been lying in. Um, yeah, and foot necrosis as well. Well, the feet, of course, are, are removed from the chicken before you, well, are chickens. I don't know whether your feet, whether the feet are removed here. So when you buy a supermarket chicken, it's got no feet. Okay. Mostly, in the developed world at least, possibly here as well, the feet um, are removed and uh, in the United States, they like to send their chickens' feet to China and they get accused of dumping them there because they sell them for uh, 10 cents a kilo or something. And in China, chickens' feet are a delicacy, so um, they get very upset about the Americans dumping chickens' feet and there's no market for their own uh, farmers' chicken in India, in India. Right. Okay, yes. Yes. Well, they can eat their own chicken. How is it used in India? It's a delicacy in India. Demand. It's a very, very high demand. Chicken feet? Yeah. Oh. Like, like peas. No, the leg piece. Oh, the leg piece. Leg piece. And, and then uh, India dumping the breast piece in U.S. <laughs> because the breast piece has a demand in the U.S. Yes. So it's very good for uh, many things, baking and all that. Mm. Nutritious lump. For, for Kentucky uh, Fried Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Less fat, that's right, yes. It's used by the, the, the major um, fast food outlets. Yeah, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, well, obviously there's bits of the chicken flying about all over the world. and uh, um, Demand-driven. Demand-driven, yes, yes. But I do know that the Chinese have... Uh, been very upset by the dumping of chicken legs. If it's a delicacy here, maybe India is not not so concerned, because probably the Americans are paying, you know, five times the price for chicken breast per kilo compared with their the chicken's feet that they're dumping here. In between some period, the India banned that dumping process, but mm. the USA put a case in WTO. So you were talking about drumsticks, weren't drumsticks. you? Drumsticks. Yeah. It's not feet, the yeah. Okay. In China, it's the feet. feet yes. yes. The claw and everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's. They fry it. Yes. There's still a market for drumsticks, of course, worldwide. But, uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Free range production. Um, let's see if we can just have a little look. I think it's press control and then click. Oh. Okay, edit hyperlink, no. <coughs> Those hyperlinks are not... Uh, okay. copy. Copy, the, copy the link, okay. Well, that might go through. Yeah. Mm, okay. Let's copy the link. So just a couple of videos of um, Western free-range production systems, perhaps to contrast with what you've got here. So this is what is becoming very popular in the West. Eggs produced under these sorts of systems. Now, th this is a reasonably high quality 
free range production system because you can see that the ground cover is good that there is some tree cover as well birds get really frightened if there's no tree cover um, and so there we can see the pop hole going into the uh, into their sheds we've got some roosters here protecting the hens it's a particularly high quality one and here you can see the trees so they, they love to roost in the trees at night that's their natural behavior wing flapping how do they um, oh have we got to go oh tea right chai ah okay yes I'm, uh, have we got two minutes just to finish up? Um, so this is mixed guinea fowl and chickens. It's a very natural, extensive system. So I put it up as sort of a bit like an ideal system. But we don't want eight minutes of it. Have everyone seen enough? Yes, okay. Let's return and just wind up. Okay, um, we, can, we can talk about continuous rotations and, uh, uh, sorry, continuous grazing and rotational grazing in chickens just like we do with cattle. Um, uh, here's a typical little shed like we saw before with nest boxes, um, with perching area, with a ladder, a pop hole. In, in Australia we have problems um, if we have that sort of a free-range system sometimes because there are too many snakes that could be a problem here perhaps as well if the grass is very tall but the, the chickens they they don't like going on to bare pasture they want some cover otherwise they get frightened because eagles will take them or some other predators here's a small scale unit can be moved around the pasture um, shades important nest box feed and water uh, so there's been a there's a big argument going on still in Australia about the stocking density what is free range and I think you alluded to that um, uh, Uter that the, the typical organic standard is a thousand birds per hectare and there must be vegetation on the land um, the Australian code of practice says 1500 birds per hectare but the Australian Egg Corporation is pushing for 20, 000, sorry, 10,000 birds per hectare to be um, the, the maximum number of birds, which is essentially one bird per square meter. Um, RSPCA has intermediate standards, uh, as does the, the UK, um, but, uh, and the US has no standards at all. Um, what, what is important is that the birds move around in clumps so it doesn't matter it's not quite as important as everyone is making out what is much more important in um, free-range chicken production is that they have cover that, and that, uh, there is cover of the land there's grass cover there's tree cover then they'll use it and it doesn't matter so much whether it's 5,000 birds per hectare or 1,000 birds per hectare. When we go into a supermarket in Australia, um, your egg cartons are labelled 1,000 birds per hectare maximum, 5,000 birds per hectare. And you buy according to what you think is a welfare parameter. But in fact, it's not so important. Now, there are other things associated with that, which is why I always tell my wife, buy the, the 1,000 <coughs> birds per hectare maximum ones, because those are likely to be organic and they have better standards generally. So the, st uh, the standard is really important. What is important um, in the range is the amount of shade available, natural shade and artificial shade, having corridors between the shade. So you might have a big tree in the uh, um, free range area, but the birds won't go there because they have to expose themselves to the, uh, to the sun and the heat of the sun and potential predation to get to the shade of that tree. So you need corridors. Um, 
the feeding enrichment is really important having feed crops herbs bushes and trees facilities for dust bathing um, dust bathing is so important to birds it's not so relevant from a nutritional perspective <coughs> but to clean the feathers and to get rid of ants um, from the feathers they will dust bathe um, and one of our PhD students has been recently looking at this they have specific calls which says yes this is a great dust bath <coughs> compared with yes this is a very tasty bit of food they have definite chicken calls good drainage is important uh, multiple pop holes into the shed and they've now designed chicken sheds where all the walls um, uh, are raised first thing in the morning to let all the birds out because it's a very common problem is that the birds will not use the range so what they do is they just remove the walls and they're, they're plastic roller walls okay so c conclusion about chickens is um, how systems and free range are very different um, evidence of a lot of adverse effects of some of those high stocking densities in the house systems birds can't perform a natural behavior in the battery cage um, I haven't talked about lighting but of course chickens are very sensitive to to different lighting systems both day length but also the color of lighting and what some of the farmers do is they use red light um, because then the birds cannot see blood on the other birds so um, chickens will cannibalize each other they will peck each other to death and particularly they start pecking around the vent area and if there's one bird gets a little bit of blood uh, on that exposed vent area because this is where they can see the skin a little bit of blood comes all the other birds move in on it and cannibalize the birds it's a horrible process and so if you put the birds in red light they can't see the blood um, and it also stimulates activity to reduce lameness because that's a really big problem with uh, uh, with growing chickens actually not so much battery cage hens the fruit free range we've seen stocking density has a variety of maximum levels uh, but what is really important is the quality of the range quality not quantity uh, there's more details here which I won't go through um, these are the RSPCA standards for for um, free range um, uh, will will everyone get access to the slides, uh, Prasenjit? Yes, I think they are, they are uh, catching the slides as well. Okay, right, yeah, so you can access them by the JNU site. Sure. Oh, and there's some references. Good, any questions about chickens? All good on chickens. So we've had a, this afternoon we've had a, a rush through all the different species just considering some of their characteristics um, not so much the production systems though we've touched on that but we've really been looking at what are the natural characteristics of each of those species from a nutritional point of view thank you for thank you very much for your attention and we'll carry on tomorrow